Um, you know, let's get started. What I'm going to do is I'll introduce Dr. Clater. Um, you know, a little bit about Dr. Clater. We really appreciate you joining us tonight. Sure. Um, I think, you know, he's a consultant for the Dental Wellbeing Advisory Committee at the ADA. Um, he's the Associate Director of the North Carolina Caring Dental Professionals. I think it's a very, um, you know, valiant um, and needed service that we have. And really what it is, is it, it, they uh, they identify, intervene, and assist members of the dental profession and their families who suffer the consequences of alcohol and other drug abuse and addi addiction, stress and professional burnout, and other impairments. And, um, you know, he can probably talk a little bit about that. Otherwise, we can kind of ask him questions about that service, um, you know, kind of being there, being there for dentists in need that are having trouble. Um, also, you know, he's well known for... Um, uh, twice, well, he's, he's actually, his newest thing is like a twice weekly forum. Uh, it's a Zoom meeting called um, Voices in Dentistry. And what it is, is it's an opportunity for um, North Carolina dentists uh, to get together and talk and share about life in dentistry from a uh, non-clinical and business standpoint. So for all of you here um, that are in North Carolina, you know, feel free to jump on. I think they're like two Wednesday evenings of the month. And it's really just kind of dentists kind of being able to uh, share their experiences and share life. And I, usually there's a theme uh, every talk. I, I had the privilege of joining one. I'm going to try to join as many as I could while we're here. Um, but also Dr. Clater gives webinars um, on marijuana, the opioid epidemic, uh, stress and burnout. And uh, again, many of you here in North Carolina uh, have come across and probably have even taken his opioid course. So, um, so he's an expert in all of that. So um, we really appreciate him joining us tonight and uh, appreciate those of you who made it here on time on St. Patty's Day uh, to join us. Hope, you know, um, I think I'll be on the lookout as people join us, but, um, you know, I think I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Clater. Thank you, Joel. Thank you very much and welcome everyone. Uh, yeah, uh, so this, this vision's from dentistry uh, uh, that he's talking about that we meet twice a month. Every dentist in North Carolina who has a license to practice will receive an email, and some of you probably have, have already received it. So uh, just kind of watch out. We send it out uh, a couple of days before each course, and uh, you'll get the information on that. So look out for that. We'd love to have your attendance and hope that you can join us sometime. Uh, we ha we've had some very, uh, you know, dentists, a lot of times we're very kind of isolating, kind of shy people in, in some ways. And we don't like to do things like this, but uh, it's been very eye-opening for a lot of people who've joined us. And so I've thoroughly enjoyed it. Let me tell you just a few other things about me. So you'll kind of, maybe I can relate to you a little bit. Um, I have uh, been in practice almost 40 years, just recently retired. And as Joel said, I, I am the associate director of the caring dentist uh, program here at North Carolina Caring Dental Professionals in North Carolina. I too, after graduating from Chapel Hill in 1980, so you can figure out my age, by the way, I'm 67 in case you can't figure this out. But in 1980, I uh, graduated and then did a two-year GPR uh, residency down at the Medical University of South Carolina in Charleston. And a great experience. And all, all you guys in GPRs or oral medicine residencies, uh, you may have had some of your friends tell you things like, oh, I can't believe you're wasting a year or two to do something like that when you could be in private practice making money. Well, let me tell you something. Those two years were some of the best years of my life not only uh, leisurely, recreationally, but also learning. And so uh, stick with what you're doing. It's, it's a win-win. Well, tonight I want to go ahead and get started and talk about the options and how you can choose good options to help mitigate, reduce burnout. And we're going to kind of break it up into four sections. I'm first of all going to define what is burnout. People have perceptions about what that is. And then also we're gonna talk about physician burnout, dentist burnout, and how they're similar and how they're different, and then mitigating strategies to mitigate burnout. And then we'll have a Q&A period uh, at the very end. So uh, Joel, if there are no other questions, I'll go ahead and get started. Okay, so what is burnout? Well, I like this definition. Uh, it's, uh, I put down here, oftentimes burnout is a self-diagnosis not really a diagnosis, but sort of a, I don't know, something's different, something's wrong. I'm not feeling the way I used to feel. That's usually the first response. And I love this little definition I wrote down. It's burnout is when your energy is depleted, you don't really have interest in people, everything, you're, you're kind of throwing up your hands going, whatever, I don't care what happens. 
and you don't really feel like you're very effective at what you do at what you do. And with that being said, you know, I like to say this, it's a bad place for us to be in. You know, if you go to work that way every day and you're thinking, you know, I don't really care. That's a, that's a, that's a red flag that's saying, Hey, Hey, something is wrong. Let's look at it. And so that's what I'm hoping that uh, we can look at tonight. Now it obviously that's not always burnout, but it could be. So let's look about what, let's look at what burnout is. I want you to know that the World, uh, World Health Organization uh, recently, actually back in May of 2019, has uh, decided to include burnout in their 11th re revision of the ICD, and they're calling burnout, and this is interesting. It says burnout is a syndrome, not a disease. It's a syndrome conceptualized, and this is the key, resulting from chronic workplace stress, including people interaction, others that you work with, and patients and other doctors, that have not, the, the stress has not been successfully managed. And that's really that dichotomy, that battle between, you know, feeling right and something's not right. So this is what burnout is. is I think of it as a time release stress pill, if you will. It's chronic stress that's not taken care of. Think of a bowl of, of water uh, and you have ping pong balls and you represent a ping pong ball as, as a, a moment of stress or a stressful item. You throw it in, and you say, oh, it's floating on top. And you, you say, I got to get rid of that. I got to, you know, uh, get rid of that stress that's in my life. So you take the ping pong ball out and now you're okay. But when you start throwing multiple ping pong balls in and you're trying to hold them all and suppress them down, sometimes what happens is when you try to press them down in the water, they pop out. And that's sort of what happens. And we see things like uh, anxiety, depression, and even burnout. And, and sometimes even further down the road, some other things that we'll talk about. But just think of, Burnout is an unmitigated, it's a un, uh, unsuccessfully managed uh, stress. Let me tell you what burnout is not. Burnout is not just simply stress uh, or multitasking or I've got three things going on. I feel really burned out. That's not really burnout. Burnout, and remember this, burnout is more about relationships, relationship with your work and relationship with your people. Uh, I'll give you an example. If you had a lawnmower that was broken and you tried to fix it and you worked on it for two or three hours and it just would not, you couldn't fix it. You wouldn't come in and tell your spouse, you know, I'm burned out. You would say, I'm stressed about this. I'm, what would you do? You'd get another lawnmower or a computer. You couldn't fix it. But with people, you can't do that a lot of times. You can't just throw them away, if you will. So we have to deal with that stress. And so it's not just having a bad day, I'm tired, all these things you see here. But what burnout really is, and I like this Yerkes, I believe that's the way you say it, Yerkes Dodson uh, graph, it's a bell curve. It shows that when we are going through the, the, the x-axis with the stress and the performance on the y-axis there, as you start out and you're not being stressed very much or you're not being engaged very much, your performance is nah, not too much. But as you can increase the stress level, you become higher, you potentially can come, it's a healthy stress. And we used to call that, and I think we still do in some uh, realms, called it eustress, a good stress. It makes us perform. I mean, you know, at the end of the game, uh, LeBron wants the ball. He's not gonna pass it to somebody else. He wants the ball. He loves that stress. He wants to perform at his maximum peak. That's an example. But what happens, as you can imagine, as we go on, then we become overstressed. And when we become overstressed, we become distressed. And so with that, we become fatigued, exhausted, panic, general anxiety disorders. Uh, 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 substance use sometimes starts during that time. And if you look on the graph, the XY graph there, you see as, as we have peak performance and peak uh, moderate stress, we tend to have peak performance. But as that stress level continues, our performance goes down. And as you see in the disease state there, that our stress levels are very high and our performances, our performance actually is very low. You may think you're performing, but don't forget performance is not just what you do at work. It's how's your family life? How's your friendship life? How's your collegial life? How's your faith life? How's all these other things may be suffering? The work is typically the last thing to go because we're so focused because that's the image people have of us. Who are we? We are dentists. We have to have a good image. We're worried about social media reviews, all, all these things that we, we think about. So let's look at the signs of burnout. And I'm not going to sit here and read them to you, but I'll just highlight a few that really come out. 
is this social withdrawal, this isolation. This is key. This is key. Nightmares, sleep disturbances are key. We see those. If you're starting to have sleep disturbances, you find yourself withdrawing from uh, events, functions, family, um, that is a huge problem. And another one is, is procrastination. We get so stuck in that realm of perfectionism, and I'm going to hopefully shed some light on perfectionism tonight that may help you look at your dentistry a little bit different in ways to process it and handle it. Uh, also, we have signs of you just don't feel like you're very effective. In fact, you know, you're just not really concerned about it. You don't care anymore. That's a dangerous place for us to be. But the number one sign, if you said, what's the number one thing that signs of burnout that you could identify? I would say, and this is just me talking, but some of the research is showing this, that when you're going along in your life in a normal fashion, normal pattern, whatever that may be, and then you say, wake up in a a couple of weeks go by and you just, something's different. You don't feel right. You're not really sick, but you know that something's not right. That could be burnout and could be the signs of burnout. Cynicism, of course, that detachment, that depersonalization we talk about. And then, uh, you know, we, 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 we start seeing things like not only substance abuse, but we also see things like boundary violations where Maybe you're overstepping your bounds with your language, with your staff or the patients, or there may be some uh, physical or sexual harassment going on that you normally would never do because you don't care anymore. So that's, a, that's like I say, a bad place for a dentist to be. Uh, know that burnout is not you got it or you don't have it. I like to say it's a, it's a spectrum. It's a continuum. And um, I think I included a little video here. I'll show you. I'm not sure if I did or not. Nope, I didn't. But anyway, it, it, we're, we're spinning plates. Uh, we're, we're constantly spinning, you know, plates, trying to keep them all going at the same time. And so you may have two or three going and then you get to the fourth and fifth and then you got to go back to the first and second one. We're constantly doing things. That is when burnout starts to really become noticeable. And there's three stages of burnout we should know about. Number one is physical fatigue. You, like we've already said, you just know that something's not right. And then you have that psychological fatigue where you can't keep things straight. Your, your spouse may ask you to go to the uh, store, pick up something on the way home from work, and you end up in the garage, and you turn around and go back to the store, and then you forget what you're going to get, and then you end up back at the office, and you're supposed to be at home, that kind of thing. And then the actual spiritual fatigue, you're, you're just, you, you just can't function. You have no relationship with, with people, uh, uh, God, or anything like that. You're just exhausted. Consequences, this is not surprising. We see a lot of, of uh, fallout from this. Uh, the most severe ones probably are drug abuse, substance use disorder. And we also have that increasing feeling of hopelessness. Hopelessness and helplessness are, is a place that's very dangerous for anyone to be, uh, not just dentists, but any, any person as we know. So the, the physical illness, sometimes we feel chronically sick when we're not. Uh, we, we, our patients are, have grown thin with other people and ourselves and our interpersonal relationships with others. I've already talked about that. Uh, organizational, we see absenteeism, increased turnover, job satisfaction, quality of work, all this starts to cascade and, and if you will, the domino effect can sometimes occur. So the way that most burnout is actually diagnosed or evaluated, especially in healthcare, uh, education, uh, sports uh, field is they use something called uh, the Maslow Burnout Inventory, and you'll hear me refer to it as MBI. Uh, burnout was a concept uh, started back in 1974 by, I believe it was a Dr. Frudenberger or somebody like that, and then 1981 was when Christina Maslach, who is at the University of California, Berkeley, or at least she used to be, she is sort of the, the guru, if you will, of, of burnout. And she has written probably more than any person on the planet about this. And so they use three, uh, it says 22 subscales, but three different sections, dimensions, if you will, to evaluate where, whether or not you have burnout. The first one is what we've already talked about, emotional exhaustion. You'll, you'll see this um, referred to in the, in the talk here tonight as the letters EE, so when I talk about EE, I'm talking about emotional exhaustion, deals with the stress dimension. Uh, the depersonalization, the cynicism, the sarcasm, like kind of just disjointed, uh, that's the interpersonal. 
it between people uh, uh, dimension. And then the reduced performance, uh, your work, uh, your stuff at work is not going well. Maybe you're just not yourself. And so that's the self-evaluation dimension. So here we go with emotional exhaustion. As you've heard me say, I'll say it one more time. Emotional exhaustion is probably the number one uh, sign of burnout when it goes from being normal to something totally different. And that's what I call listen to your body. Your body is telling you something's not right. It may not be burnout. It may be a medical condition. Get it checked out. Depersonalization. There's a, there's a term known as compassion fatigue. And the best way I can describe compassion fatigue is like this guy says, I have nothing else to give to this relationship. Sometimes you see this in marriages where the marriages won't work. They're trying to make it work and they just can't put the pieces, the puzzle back together and they're just tired and they give up. Um, I remember one time when I was in practice early on, I had a patient, nice young, uh, nice older gentleman that used to come to me and he, he would not you know, do the, the implants or the bone graft and all that kind of stuff. He just wanted his denture. So we made the denture and I bet I adjusted the lower denture 37, 40 times. Uh, and, and you say, why'd you do that? Uh, you know, I'm codependent. I want to help people. I want people to like me. I want, you know, that kind of stuff as we are a lot of times as healthcare givers. But I got to the point to where that's the way I felt when it, he was out of the office. When he came in, I had that smile on my face and I'm sure we've all been there. And then the third thing is, is the performance accomplishment. So we've got the emotional exhaustion, we've got the depersonalization, and now we've got the performance accomplishment. And this is a really scary place because you, when you start asking yourself, why am I doing this? Why am I here? Why did I choose dentistry? Do I really like what I'm doing? You know, these are scary places to be and you need to address them because they won't go away. They need to be addressed. And we'll talk about that. And so you, you, you start seeing issues with your, your dental work, your own self-worth, and you just become, you know, guilty, shameful, all these emotions that we experience. And then we throw in COVID. And I, I love this picture of the sort of a, a nebulous future. Uh, we started out and we had the fear of everything or losing something, not getting what we wanted, not knowing what's going to happen next. As I say, the fear of the uncertainty of the future and then the stress and the anxiety. But, you know, one of the things that has come out of this, it's been a good thing, and it's really been sort of a, a good, I don't want to say promo, but a good um, thing during the COVID time is that so many people have told you about what to do and how to deal with the stress of the COVID and burnout. And I want to show you the structure, if you will, the well-being. Now, I use this building. I think I love that picture of that, 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 uh, that those sides of that building going up in, in the perfect squares. But we know that well-being lives off of things that are structured. Our emotions, structure regulates our emotions. And there's a routine or framework to our lives. And that's why during COVID, I was real big at the beginning as we all were in April of last year, shut down. What do we do? Do we go to work? We couldn't go to work. Uh, I would always get in the car and drive to the post office or drive to the uh, to fast food place to get a sandwich or something just to get out of the house, to have a routine of getting out. And then I'd always call my friends. I'd always have Zoom meetings. I always wanted to keep my structure going. A little bit different method, but a, but a way of keeping structure going. So social connections and routines mitigate depression and burnout. If I could say, if you take anything away from tonight's talk, Social connections, even through Zoom, even through a phone call, even through the neighbor's backyard, waving at them, talking at them, and routines, keep your routines going. Our brains are set up to recognize that as I'm well. So remember that. That's, all, that's my preaching for the night. <laughs> all right, so let's look at the physicians. Almost all of the research in burnout and well-being has been done by phys on physicians. I'd say 90, 95%. Uh, and, and that's for a good reason, because they're under a lot of stress that we're not under. But the same stress that physicians are experiencing right now, we're exposed to, too. We're just in a different, different world, if you will. You know, dentistry, we think of as private practice. We're in this cottage industry. We're isolated. We got to get out and meet our colleagues. But, you know, we look at our colleagues a lot of times as competitors. We're physicians from day one, a lot of times start out in little groups and they have their colleagues. They're not competitors. And so we, we always think dentists are taking, when they come into our community or our areas, 
and they set up shop that they're taking business away from us. And I would just encourage you, and I know I had to do this personally. It's not about them coming in, setting up next door to you. It's about what are you not doing that you need to be doing to have that well-being about your practice. So I'm, I'm, I'm encouraging you to take a look at yourself. And that's what I had to do. And I could tell you the story sometime, but uh, the physicians, most of the ones that, that have been researched, I mean, they've looked at all different specialties, but the internist and the family docs that are out there, uh, you know, they're not uh, procedural uh, driven. We as dentists are more like surgeons. We're doing these, you know, specific procedures every day that have paperwork at the beginning, paperwork at the end, and then engulfing the whole things of the personalities of the patient and the financials. So we have all that dynamic going on where in the physician world, most of the time they go and do the, the surgery, they've got somebody else to do all that. And I know some of our offices will have that or you will have people that do your things like that, but it's a little bit different. But at the same time, we're under the exact same uh, kind of pressures. So we're gonna talk about that. Uh, this article came out in the New York Times, I believe it was about 2012, it said about 50% of the physicians in America report that they have uh, burnout. And the question that I asked was, is this rooted in the environment and the, and the delivery system, the healthcare delivery system of medicine, or is it just a result of a few susceptible, if you will, weak, quote unquote, individuals who couldn't handle the stress? Well, I think we all know the answer to that. And there's a, a reference uh, uh, publication that kind of collects data from all the burnout issues along with some other topics, but it's called Spoke, S-P-O-K. You can Google that. And it gives you all the breakdown of, um, of the stats that are coming in about burnout. But 92% of clinicians say that burnout is a health crisis that demands urgent aid, uh, action. Uh, we know that from the experience of some have said that it's considerably or greatly affected their uh, careers. I mean, as many as 70% plus now, it's way over that now in some polls or surveys. And while 11% said it not, had not really been a problem yet, the burnout, the stress. Burnout and physicians. 2011, 33% reported burnout, 54% in 2014. In 2016, it was 74%. And according to the survey done in the 2018 version of America's uh, uh, Physicians Practice, uh, it's called Physicians Foundation, that up to 78% of physicians reported some level of burnout. And again, you know, this is a scary place for a physician to be. Uh, when looked at in the study of medical students, residents, and practices in MDs, but this was back in 2014, it was around 50 to 60%, depending on which group you looked at. And this was, this was a, a matched, if you will, and you see that 1.36 times education. It, what, it, what they were doing was looking at people who had the same level of education as physicians, uh, but were non-MD peers and that our the MDs were like stressed more. So you see that 1.36 times the educational equivalent of a non-MD uh, career. Um, Last month, uh, February 2021, in uh, New England Journal Medicine Catalyst, some of you may have seen this article in Insights. It was talking about uh, clinician burnout. And I want to spend a few minutes here to talk about the differences in the way physicians and dentists are trained and what we perceive and how we perceive things differently and in a lot of ways the same way. So the question was asked, do you anticipate that healthcare provider burnout will get better, stay the same, or get worse in the next two to three years? at your organization? Well, you see almost 90 plus percent said it was gonna get worse or stay the same. Um, you look further, this is kind of hard to read. If you got a big computer screen, you can kind of see it, but it, it's worth noting that the number one issue in this area was the electronic health record. I mean, every poll, no matter who's doing it or survey or research is showing that the uh, electronic health record is, you know, and it's not just the, the actual computer, it's the IT part of it, it's the software part of it, it's the filling in all the blanks, it's giving all the proper codes, it's the clerical side, that the inefficiencies and frustrations that physicians feel, not only the, with the administrative part of it, but with just the whole culture of, of the thing is up to as high as well over 90%, I've seen some 92, 95%, so it's a pretty universal problem. 
Are we there yet? I know a lot of practices, we still uh, do things by hand, but most of the practices today that I've been associated with are still, are, are now using the, you know, health records. Now we don't have that volume of transmitting all the data as much as the physicians, but it's coming and that's where we're going. And just look at DSOs and look at the, the corporate model that's coming in. They run off that stuff. And so we're, we're, if you're not there yet, you will be, and it's just a matter of time. And it's not a bad thing necessarily. I don't mean it to sound like it's bad. It can be good, uh, used for good. Uh, impact of em medical uh, emergency medical records, uh, almost 79% say it won't improve. It's gonna stay the same, worsen or get greatly worse over the next two to three years. Uh, large national study done by the Mayo Clinic uh, showed that physicians who work with EHRs, which are all of them, and use computerized physician order entry forms, uh, you know, that their, their overall impression of this system is very low. They don't have a great impression of it because of the clerical demands and the high, uh, the, just the high frustrations and inefficiencies they feel in it. And so their, their medical record errors are going to go up and they just feel like they're just, I mean, not go up, but their risk of burnout is going to go up is what I meant to say. And because they're having to meticulously make sure every T is crossed, every dot's I, uh, I is dotted, which is a good thing. But at the same time, it can be very burdensome and cumbersome. So uh, a, lot of, a lot of good resources out there to talk about this. Uh, now, if you look at this, I want, I want to really spend some time on this one too, leadership engagement. So they asked, um, what are the top two leadership practices? What are the top two leadership practices that support lessening burnout? So what two things can happen? And this is not only happening in medicine, but this is happening in all works. I mean, whether what it, different industries from the hotel industries to management, to industry, to, to uh, all types of, of industries around the country, the top two things that, that come up over and over, and I'm going to you don't have to read that graph, but I'm going to jump ahead here just a minute. The top two things that are required today to overcome burnout is for leadership to be trained, get trained if they don't have it, and know how to guide people through this time because there's, there's training out there. And number two, and probably the best one, is they need to listen to what their employees are saying. Doesn't mean they incorporate everything that they're, that they're saying or believing, but they listen to them. An example, uh, if I ask you what are the top two needs of a human being is to be recognized and to be accepted, to, to, to have someone accept you into a group, have someone to accept you who you are. So when you, when you have someone that accepts you, like in a dental practice, say in a private practice, you're the, 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 the dentist and you have employees and you want to value their input. Even if you disagree with it, you want to you know, thank them for sharing, encourage them to share again, and then listen to what they're saying and implement some of the things because we don't have all the answers. It's going to be a collective pattern of, of that. So we need to listen to what our people recognize that they're important, accept who they are, and recognize what they're, they're saying because they do have answers. And, and I mean, I don't know anyone that's done this that is not helping. And this is sort of where, you know, uh, it's like one guy in the hotel industry once said, why do you like your job so much? Uh, when it was asked by uh, an outside source, he said, because my managers come to me and they say, Bob, what can I do for you to make you do your job better? You know, I've never asked my employees that, but I should have when I was in practice, that might've given some answers. I mean, I was afraid to ask because I didn't know what the answer was gonna be. I didn't know to ask. So as Joel and I were saying earlier, we don't know what we don't know. So we need to listen to other people. We don't have all the answers. And then this is the one, some of you that live here in North Carolina have seen this, uh, where we, or you know that we just did a, a survey, a burnout survey for all dental hygienists and all dentists practicing in North Carolina. And uh, the top two were the anxiety felt during this COVID time. And actually one of the top ones in North Carolina was the sleep and weight gain changes either up or down, mainly up, but sleep disturbances and anxiety and isolation. And I want to speak to you just a minute about isolation. I do a whole thing on isolation. I love this topic. Uh, some of you may know Dr. Uh, Holt Lundstad over at BYU and, and, and Provo, and she's a researcher in neuroscience and like longevity and you know what, what it is that keeps people 
alive for a long time. And so she collects a lot of data. She's done a lot of research herself and continues to do a lot of research. And some of you may have seen this before, but I think it's pertinent during this COVID time, not that we're looking at our lives over a long period of time, but just during this COVID time. But just think about what would happen if we lived our lives like we're living now in COVID for the rest of our lives. In other words, it's not just a year or two that we're living this way. To say we had to live the next 30 or 40 years that way. Okay. So she went to places and had research that was done in all these different places, collected data all over the world. I mean, they, you know, found people that were living into their nineties and even the hundreds in these villages in Greece and Italy and China and all different places. And the question was, what is it you did? What is it you do? Or what happened to you that makes you feel like you lived that long? And they were trying to look at everything being one-on-one -on -one equal, you know, as far as all the parameters. And this is interesting. She took the top 10 and listed what it was that the people who lived the longest had in common. Well, the bottom five were these. 10 was clean air. Controlling your blood pressure was nine. Weight, overweight, underweight, you know, that was number eight. Is it important to, to worry about that? To a point. But the point was statistically, you know, whether it's a high carb, low carb, high fat, all these studies are pretty much, uh, you see people that are overweight that live to be 90. You see some that died when they're thin at 60. So it's, you know, it's a lot of other things, genetics, all that kind of stuff playing in. But the weight wasn't a huge issue in longevity. Exercise wasn't, yay, yay, you know, <laughs> going to the gym. Maybe we won't have to go to the gym as much. <clears throat> anyway, uh, and then cardiac rehab, that was important. But I'm not saying any of these are not important. It's just what she was showing as far as the predictors of longevity. Interestingly enough, the flu shot was over all of these. So if you got the flu shot, that was a greater predictor of whether or not you'd be living longer than all these others below it. The other uh, fourth and third were stop boozing and smoking. And interestingly, I'm not sure you can probably guess, number one and two were having interactions, meaningful interactions with close friends on a regular basis. And so this brings up my point. I know we're talking about one period of time, the COVID time, but don't isolate. The biggest disease, of, the biggest indicator of disease, I think in America, when we isolate, we get depressed, we turn things in on ourselves. We don't, our thoughts become ours. We become unrational. We need other people. We were made to be in relationship with other people. So I, I just encourage you to look that study up if you haven't seen it before. So what are clinicians? What, what prevents cl clinicians from seeking help? Well, they say the organization doesn't really have the structure. About 65% say they don't have the structure to really seek help. And those who could seek help don't have time to go. Uh, the stigma of it, you know, oh, I'm, I'm a doctor. I should be able to figure this out. What if somebody knew I was getting help for mental illness or, uh, you know, panic or whatever? And then 54% are worried about, you know, and probably rightfully so about the privacy issues, the, you know, of their health information. And then you look further and you say, the clinicians, tell me, what do you believe will help? 95%, not surprisingly, say it, improving the electronic health record and the usability of it, make it more friendly. Supporting mental health treatments, and then also having a wellness director. I'm, I think in the future, in, at least in big corporate practices, dental practices or group practices, we're gonna not only see an insurance person and a front desk person making appointments or whatever, we're gonna see a wellness director, an office. And I'm not talking about just telling you to go out and exercise, but you know, maybe one day a, a, a month or one day a week, you you have a, a little kitchen in your office, you cook healthy food, you try to emulate, show what a healthy lifestyle is. And you say, well, that, that's not going to work. That's happened before. But yet it's part of the puzzle. You may try it. It may not work in your situation, but it could show people that you do have a choice. There is a way to improve. Now with the physicians, again, as I mentioned, their training started out, if you will, to some degree, uh, collegially, uh, uh, colleagues, uh, they talked to each other, they exchanged ideas, they listened, uh, they are, um, you know, more about the process, the global view of going forward. And in dentistry, we sometimes, our training is more like the checker, you know, who, when we go to clinic, who's going to check us that day? And it's like, we feel like we're being judged and we have this enormous, enormous uh, um, 
what's the word I'm looking for? The enormous propensity to, we, we, we just want people to uh, like us. I mean, we, we're like dogs in a, in a lot of ways. You know, we're, we want to be petted. We want to be stroked. We want to hear the attaboys and the attagirls because that builds our confidence up. And then when we hear somebody say, that was bad, you didn't do well, you feel like you're down. Well, you say, well, that's human nature. It is to a degree, but also how you respond to it is, is not, it can be healthy and it can be unhealthy. So we'll, we'll get into that more. But dentistry is more procedure driven. It's more intense environment in healthcare delivery. A physician's office, I'm not saying that they're laid back and everybody is drinking coffee all the time, but at the same time, we are more structured. We're, we're, we're constrained by two main constraints, time and difficult procedures or patients, which we'll talk about. And so I wanna kind of put this in perspective to kind of show you, I hope I do that. There's a great article, sort of a, a landmark in this burnout uh, literature, if you will, written back almost 20 years ago now by Rada and Johnson Leung um, called Anxiety, Depression and Burnout. And in the article, uh, it was in the journal, the American Dental Association, 2004, it said that due to the clinical practice, our clinical nature and the personality traits, our sometimes passive aggressive, uh, avoidant kind of personalities that a lot of us uh, have, uh, the introversion, about two thirds of dentists have processed information through introversion and our way of not being able to deal with uh, processing things and, and the OCD-ness that we have, the obsessive compulsive disorder way sometimes that we end up in due to our clinical practice and personality traits that we're prone to anxiety, we're prone to depression and we're uh, prone to a professional burnout. And let's, let's just look at that a minute. So I wanna go back to the article from the New York Times where it asked the question, were physicians prone due to the environment, the healthcare delivery system, or was it because of a few weak individuals? So I turned that around and I asked the same question to us as dentists, are we, is it the system that's broken? Um, you know, dentists are a little bit different than physicians uh, or is it a personal thing? Is it just that we're weaker or we're more stressed out than physicians? I don't know, let's look at what data is showing. What leads dentists to burnout? Well, we have, as it says, a 25% uh, we're higher with coronary artery disease and high blood pressure than among the general population in the US. Our, 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 so we're 25% higher in the risk of coronary artery and high blood pressure. 60%, over half the dentists in the US work 10 hours a day. And the number one killer in dentists is still stress-related cardiovascular disease. Now that's true of other professions too, but this is the thing I wanna bring your attention to. In the study directly comparing dentists with physicians, we are two to two and a half times greater risk and greater uh, signs. I mean, we actually have two to two and a half times greater psychoneurotic disorders, such as um, generalized anxiety disorder, panic, uh, depression, uh, OCD. I mean, we become very obsessive and compulsive about perfection and all this kind of stuff. So we are at greater risk compared to physicians in the study. Um, we, we are a dentist common complaints. We're constantly fearful. We're constantly exhausted. We have different kinds of aches in our bodies. I mean, between neck and lower back, these are the number one um, stressors. And I'll tell you, you know, if you're thirties or if you're in your thirties or forties and you say, I'm not going to get this, I work out, I watch my weight, I eat right. I just, I'm just telling you that uh, the body is not really set up to, uh, to stay in the positions we're in for a long period of time without some type of, you know, re reprieve. I mean, you know, Tiger Woods is a great example. His swing was so dramatic and so forceful that people said he, he would never last till he's 50 because of the way he was hitting the ball. You know, his body's telling him he's had five back surgeries and other surgeries for different things. So it's the same with dentists. I don't care how great you are in shape. If you come unscathed, if you will, to retirement without a back or neck problem, Congratulations. And along that same lines with the pain and discomfort, a lot of times, you know, or most of the time, human beings don't like to feel pain. So we look for relief. We look through alcohol or, or other drugs. Study done by the ADA not too long ago, 86% of the dentists in America 
experience this in any given year, at least lack of focus, energy, mental capacity, mistreatment. We get so just out of kilter with stress. We can't even, we misdiagnose or underdiagnose cases. We don't present uh, treatment uh, uh, treatment plans because we don't want to be, we're fearful of someone telling us no or they can't pay for it. And a lot of times we'll just put off treatment until we feel like we can handle it. And the thing of it is, the study went on to say that in any given year, 60 days, that's five days out of each month per year, a dentist is so significantly stressed or disengaged that they lose in one of these five things above, you know, the, the focus, energy, not presenting things. So if you think about it, we are in a very stressful situation and how you deal with that, uh, I, I don't think it's really... I don't think it's really a susceptibility of the person as much as it is possibly the way the system is. And so we'll, we're, we're, we're getting there. So let's talk about that. So what areas of dentistry are the most stressful? This is just a little tidbit I threw in here. The highest uh, specialty in dentistry with stress, probably not surprising, are the oral surgeons and the general dentist. The lowest are the orthodontist. Now, they all have back problems, but... You, you get the point, our neck problems probably as time goes on, they have the chance of getting it. So as we've spoken earlier, but these are the ones that have the highest rate of burnout. So if you're a GP or an oral surgeon, know that maybe you're up on a little bit higher uh, rung of that ladder that for potential of, of developing stress. Not that orthodontists can't develop all the things, but they're the lowest in some studies. So why do we, why do we develop burnout? I came up with a list of about 20 things, clinical things that we experience, but these are the top six that seem to keep coming up of the people that I see and talk to. The isolation and confinement is killing us. We need to get out and, and extend our hand out and not just talk about it, but you know, show up at, at dental society meetings, at, at regional meetings, at state meetings, just be part of the community and not isolate. Have some another dentist in town you can friend and go to lunch with him or her once a month, just set a time out, you know, the fifth of every month we do this or uh, the first week or whatever. Uh, difficult patients, demanding patients, uh, perfectionism we're, we're getting into, absorbing patient and staff anxieties. That's a huge one. We come in and we think somebody doesn't like us. My staff's going to leave. This person's not happy. And we just forget that it's their problem. And a lot of times what we think they're experiencing, they're really not. It's just our perception of it the scheduling um, and the work overload, and then the low self-esteem. I'm not good enough. I'm not gonna try new procedures because I just know I can't do it. Of these top six, probably the two that I've seen the most issues with are scheduling issues and demanding or difficult patients. A study, and I think I have it in here, I believe it's, no, it's not here, but in, in this uh, study, it was shown that the number one issue in dentistry that causes the most stress is scheduling. It's not difficult or demanding patients. Uh, we all know we have about five patients that, um, pardon my French here, but that we would hope that would just kind of go somewhere else, drop off the face of the earth, you know, that bug us to death. You'll have them if you haven't gotten them yet. But uh, the thing of it is they love us. That's why they keep coming back to us because we treat them nice. So just know there's going to be demanding patients, but there's nothing like dealing with them once or twice a year than dealing with, constantly not taking control of your schedule. So we talk about things like block scheduling and time off between procedures and, and you know, doing quadrant dentistry and all this kind of stuff. We'll, we'll, we're gonna show you some examples of that. There's a one study that I found so far that associated the personality disturbances of dentists to, a, to the burnout syndrome. It's a small study of about 75 dentists in three different graduate programs in, at the University of Barcelona. And they found that 75% of those 75 had OCD diagnosable tendencies that were unstable, impulsive, needed excessive admiration, the, you know, the petting the, the dog, if you will, and a very uh, self-centered narcissistic kind of personality. And this also had a tendency to develop into burnout. Uh, there, there are other studies being done now, and I'm sure we'll find some similar results or something leading, indicating uh, in that direction. Uh, in Maslock, I like to break this down and kind of give you an example. When they talk about burnout, and for those who took the burnout survey here in North Carolina, you found your, your reports that you got in your packet of, of your, your own personal evaluation, five categories in North Carolina 
and, and they use it in all categories, but these are the five categories of burnout. A person who is engaged in dentistry in life with relationships, they have a low emotional exhaustion and depersonalization, but they have a high performance. This is where you want to be. This is, this is the healthy dentist. The ineffective one has a low uh, professional uh, accomplishment. They're just not, they're just not, uh, they don't feel like they're making a difference. The overextended one obviously has a high emotional exhaustion uh, quotient. And the disengaged, they don't really care about people. They're just kind of like cynical about everything, sarcastic. They have a high depersonalization. And then you can imagine the high emotional and depersonalized person is a burned out person. And that's, that's the kind of reason, that's the reason we did the test uh, or the survey, if you will, so that you could kind of see that MBI, uh, what your MBI was. You can still take it online, just w Google it and you, you can take it online to see where you are. Now, the other area that, that we always like to evaluate for is called uh, areas of work life survey, AWS. So we're gonna look at stressors in our work life. And so I'm gonna go through this kind of fast, uh, but I wanna kind of talk to you about how essential this is to change burnout. Now, before I get started, I'm gonna give you some things that happen in the office and kind of some reasons maybe why they happen. And at the end of it, I'm gonna say, okay, all you gotta do is don't do that anymore or start doing that anymore. Now, it's not just as simple as that as you can imagine because it's not do this and this and you won't have burnout but it's, you know, it's multifaceted. And one of the things that you'll hear a lot of people say, including myself, is, you know, to mitigate burnout symptoms, you need to exercise and walk and eat right, sleep. And that's all true. But nothing's going to change. Uh, my favorite saying, nothing changes if nothing changes. Nothing's going to change until you address what's going on at work or with another human being in a relationship. So they look at this as a job employee, kind of, they call them mismatches. And there are six areas. And the first one they're looking at, they're, or they're looking at all of them for their root cause. What are the organizational problems at work, at, in, in the workplace in this situation? What change are you gonna make to change the, the situation? And then they look at these six areas. And so I'm gonna show you uh, how this, if it's not, if the employee is not matched with the organization, this can lead to burnout. And you'll see here these six areas, and we're gonna go through each one of them individually here. Uh, to talk more specifically at the dental office. So let's talk about the work overload. This is what work overload sounds like. I, you know, a lot of statements, but here's this young lady. She says, I don't have time to do the work that must be done. It could be due to a lot of things. It could be due to overscheduling, conflicts. Of the, the two assistants are having a quarrel this day and neither one, one wants to do their jobs and you're having to stop to take care of that and it's putting you further behind. Your staff's not, you're not letting your staff do enough. If your staff is wanting to, if you're wanting to do all your temporary crowns and you say, you know, I need to train my staff to do that. And you're running behind. There's a lot of things like that. Individual tooth dentistry versus quadrant dentistry. And well, my patients won't pay for it. That's too much. Have that discussion with somebody who knows how to make that happen. It, it, it works. I'm telling you, when you switch to quadrant dentistry versus individual tooth dentistry, and then dealing with that constant thing, I've got to do it over, I've got to do it over, it wasn't perfect. So that's one example how the stress can build up at work. So work overload is number one. Lack of control, this is what this sounds like. It could say I have control over how I do my work. It could say I don't have control. Uh, maybe somebody else is telling you what your production numbers should be. And maybe your patient's coming late and they're not paying their bills and you get these negative social media reviews. This is huge right now. I've seen young practitioners out there in today's world who get the, you know, the fours and fives and they're just on cloud nine and then they'll get a two because the patient says they didn't give me my opioids or they wanted more money or something. And then this is devastating to the, to the dentist. And they say, gosh, I can't believe somebody wrote a bad review. You know, it takes about 100 to 150 good reviews to push a negative review like that out. I mean, you want one negative review, but you don't want two or three. So this is huge. People can say whatever they want to at any time. Uh, you don't have control of what mood our staff comes in in the morning. You certainly don't have control when you say, oh, I'm doing an MO today on number 19 and the mesolingual cusp breaks off and you've got 40 minutes to do it. Now you're gonna have to do a crown. So this kind of issue, these kind of issues, you, sometimes you feel like you've lost control. Insufficient rewards. Boy, this was a huge one. I received recognition from others for my work. Now it's not only financial. One of the biggest rewards I heard a guy teach me years ago, he said, 
a, the simple thank you to your staff members throughout your career goes further than you'll ever know. And I, I abided by that and did that. And, you know, I've had staff members over the years tell me, You're, I've worked for a lot of dentists. No one's ever said thank you. They don't even acknowledge my work. We need to recognize and accept them as people, recognize their work and who they are and accept them as people. If they need correcting, do it gently. You know, show them how to do it right. Encourage them. They can do it. But let's say you don't receive recognition like thank you or you feel like I'm doing this hard work for nothing. I'm working for peanuts. Well, it could be that you are working for peanuts and it could just be due to poor scheduling, chaotic uh, scheduling, even conflicts in the office. Uh, you know, you, you want that appreciation, you're not getting it, um, increased paperwork, uh, all the demands from the government and all the forms we fill out. I mean, the, the list goes on and on. And you're saying, is it really worth doing this job for this? I need either increased fees or find something else. I had a young man one time who was so burned out. He said he's going to become an airline pilot. He had 80 hours of flight instruction under his, under his wings, or, you know, where he'd flown 80 hours and I said, who are you going to fly for? And he said, well, I'm thinking about American Airlines or United. And I said, do you have any ideas how much, uh, how many hours those people have that are pilots? And he goes, no, how many? And I said, tens of thousands. And he goes, oh. So I asked him, I said, are you just frustrated with all the paperwork and all the extraneous stuff of dentistry? Or do you really not like doing a crown or doing a root canal or doing a denture or whatever you like doing? And he goes, no, I love dentistry. I just don't like all the other stuff around it. You know, identify what's going on. Identify where your problem is. It may not be dentistry. Breakdown of the community, the dental community. Members of my work group communicate or don't communicate openly. It may be either way, but hopefully it's, they do communicate. But what if they don't? You know, you don't, you don't know what the left, left hand doesn't know what the right hand's doing. Um, your, your staff is, is whispering behind your back saying, Doc's not up to what he used to be. I, something's wrong with him today. And then, then, the, then the staff always take sides. There's a couple staff members that it's on the doc side and there's a couple staff members that want to leave. And then you start getting tardiness and absent, you know, all this breakdown. So you need to keep in touch with your people. You need to accept them for who they are. And yeah, you got it. Listen to them, recognize what they're doing. Absence of fairness. Resources are allocated fairly or not allocated fairly. That really shows up a lot of times in what's called favoritism. You'll see one employee come to you and say, you like her better than me, or you like him better than me. Uh, and then, uh, well, why do they get the same bonus I get? They hadn't been here as long as I have. Uh, and then I, I love this picture. I have this mental picture in my mind of a staff sitting around a big table and they're all fighting at each other, and the dentist is hovering above the pa above the table, if you will, sort of in a trance, going, "But just put my head in the sand long enough, this will go away. It's not going to go away. You have to you have to address it, and you have to be fair in the way you treat people. People are watching, and then conflicting values. This is a big one. I love the term cognitive dissonance. You know, organization is asking you to do something that you know is wrong, or it just goes against what you know to be true. And so this, we see this, this breakdown. And so when you have cognitive dissonance, a lot of times uh, people get that cynicism and you end up uh, just over-treating. I mean, I've seen dentists actually say everything needs a crown and I've seen dentists won't even do a crown and, 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 and the staff's going like, that patient shouldn't have had to have a crown. It just needed a occlusal. Why do you do it? You know, and they're talking and then you see the financial end sometimes with embezzling money. That's a big one too. About one in six offices in a lifetime will have embezzlement going on in their office. And then lying to a patient just outright. I've heard the dentist telling patients that things that are just aren't true. And I'm not talking about questionable things. I'm think, talking about things uh, and a way to produce production, to increase production. And so it becomes a very unprofessional workplace, as I say. And then you start seeing harassment and boundary violations. And so you know, these are issues that, that can drive burnout. So this is why we have to, you know, identify really what's the source of our stress. Is it dentistry or is it the environment or is it both? It could be a lot of different things. I really would like to talk more about that, but I don't have time. But I want to go on and talk a little bit about perfectionism and kind of give you my definition of perfectionism that I adopted from a wiser person than myself. 
Perfectionism really is a spiritual condition. It's a spiritual issue. And I love this. It's a not denial of one's humanness. It's, we're, we're, we're not made to be perfect. We're made to be in relationship with each other and, and, and our God. In, in God. And so perfectionistic concerns, these are the concerns that were looked at, did a lot of research over in England at St. John's University, York St. John's University by Dr. Hill. And he's sort of the guru in perfectionism and their research behind it. He's done a lot of meta-analysis in this. And they looked at the two types of perfectionism that we kind of deal with as doctors, but it can be applied to really anything. But uh, any profession, but the two are concerns and strivings. And we're first of all going to start talking about concerns. These are when our standards are this way. Let me kind of give you an example. If you practice dentistry or look at life and your standards that you set out are unreachable or unreasonable, your, your motto, your mantra is only perfection. You're going to redo it if it's not perfect. Uh, if you look at failure, as catastrophizing that, you know, you, you can see yourself sitting in front of the state board and they're taking your license and patient's going to get a $2 million settlement or you're in severe depression, you're taking all these pills or what if, what if, what if the nth degree kind of thought pattern or you become defensive when someone criticizes you and you, you're always saying, no, no, that's not what I meant. That's not, you know, or, or you see mistakes as I'm, I am unworthy. I am not a good person. I should have, if I'd have been better in dental school, I would not have done this. And then you become so paralyzed, you're not willing to step out and look at new techniques or ideas, and then you procrastinate. Procrastination is a tremendous paralyzer of dental practices. People won't go forward. They won't move with the times. They won't do that, what's the, in vogue now called the best practices. And so just if that's where you are, I certainly can raise my hand on several of those in my career. But the thing in the area that you want to really look at is this kind of thinking and just kind of showing you both sides of the coin, if you will. Perfectionistic strivings. If your standards are reachable and reasonable, um, this year, I'm just throwing out numbers, we're going we're gonna to go from 500,000 in production to 2.5 million. Now, that's not reachable. But 500 to 600 with a plan sounds reasonable. Perfection. I'm not going to try to be perfect. I'm going to try to do what I think would be acceptable. And it's excellent dentistry, not, not bad dentistry, but acceptable. And when things aren't perfect, I'm going to, you know, thank the good Lord above that he's taking care of me and that we're going to, you know, our dentistry does pretty well. We're not perfect, okay? It lasts for a long time. So perfection. Failure, we bounce back quickly when we have a negative episode, a negative uh, event to occur. And we, we look at this whole practice of dentistry as an enjoyment because in ups and downs, it's like that a sine wave, it's just back and forth, up and down. And we're gonna enjoy the ride. Sometimes the ride's smooth, sometimes the ride's not. But as I like to say, your faith, God has your back and you have to be faithful that you're gonna get through this. The criticism, see criticism as a learning experience. What can I glean from this? What can I learn from this? He's, he doesn't know how to criticize me, but what is he trying to tell me? Maybe I do feel defensive, but let me, what can I glean from it and go forward? Mistakes, look at them as opportunities and learning experiences. And then being open and receptive, remain humble, teachable, accept criticism and ask for helpful criticism. Now, I, I, again, I'm kind of throwing a lot of stuff out at you. I wish I had time to talk more about how that could be incorporated, but I want to talk a little bit about mitigation strategies. And uh, I, I want to just review at the end here about the difference between stress and burnout. And, and I know this is all listed here, but I think it's worth going over each one of them. Burnout is when you're disengaged, depersonalized. Stress is not when you can't do anything, you're over-engaged, you're too busy, you got too much going on, you can't spin all the plates. Uh, and burnout, it's sort of like depression, you know, your emotions are blunted. And stress, you're over active. Your emotions are like, you know, hyper vigilant. I mean, you're just hyper vigilant, just all over the place. You're just, you're always, reacting to everything that happens. In burnout, you don't have much of a future. You're, you're pretty helpless and hopeless. But in stress, everything has to be right then. It has to be urgent. It has to be urgent. And the urgency, the tyranny of the urgent, I call it, and you become hyperactive. In burnout, you lose your ideals, your motivation. Why am I here? You heard me say why many times. Why did I do this? But in stress, you want to do it and you still do it, but you kind of lose your energy. And stress is associated with anxiety disorders, a lot of pressure, a lot of stress. Burnout's beyond that. It's detachment. You're, you're, you're in chronic, maybe uh, severe depression. 
Uh, stress is primarily physical. Burnout is emotional. Uh, stress is, can result in acute or physical disease like we talked about, heart, uh, psychosomatic diseases, um, all you know, substance use disorder. But burnout ends up to be sort of like, you know, I don't care. And, and sometimes it leads to suicide. Uh, stress usually can be identified and can be treated. And uh, burnout sometimes is hard to recognize. It can be recognizable, but you have to listen for the signs that we talked about tonight. And then stress, uh, the individual a lot of times picks it up. You know, I'm under stress. I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to, I'm going to bed early tonight. I'm not going to do what I normally do. I, I don't feel right. And then the next day you wake up and you feel better. Okay. Burnout, you, you just keep doing the same thing. You're like on a merry-go-round and you don't understand what's going on and you, and you can't see it. So in review, these three dimensions of burnout, emotional exhaustion, to be engaged in life. The opposite of burnout, I like to say, is engagement. And to be engaged, you have energy. You want to do. You can't wait to go to work. You can't wait to learn the next thing. You can't wait to deal with the next crisis, quote, unquote. Uh, depersonalization, uh, the opposite of that is get involved. Don't isolate. Call friends. Get with people. You know, be involved. And then a reduced performance, the opposite of that is efficacy. So, you know, you want to be efficient and keep learning and take CEs and go to the next step. And if you say, well, I don't want to do 15 new techniques that are out there, pick two or three and enjoy them. Do, if you don't want to do it, don't do it, but do something to better yourself, to keep yourself energized. So this is a study that was a collective study done about eight, uh, it was an eight year study done back in the mid 2000s, early 2000s. And it was done by uh, Mayo Clinic, uh, I think it's Amer I supposed to say the American Medical Association and the University of Washington um, on conclusions about MD burnout, what they found. And so I'm, 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 I'm here to say that we're not there yet in dentistry the same way the physicians are, but we're right on their tail. And in some ways, the stress level is much, much greater right now. And we're probably going to end up there kind of through the back door, if you will, with the number of burnout cases. Burnout has a high prevalence in medicine, especially in certain related fields, anesthesiologists, emergency room doctors, you know, things like that. Um, high prevalence of substance abuse when you have burnout, depression, suicide thoughts and suicide uh, attempts, medical errors, dissatisfaction with your personal and professional lives. Um, it, usually burnout is recognizable, reversible, and treatable. It's preventable, too, if you recognize this, the symptoms. Uh, it's easier to treat excuse me, it's easier to prevent than treat. Treatment is not like a long weekend at the lake and come back and you, you're through with burnout. Burnout goes for years. You have to have therapy and counseling. It takes years. Typically, some people say up two to four years before you see any type of uh, breathing above water, if you will, as far as dealing with the burnout and how to manage it. Uh, again, you heard me say, listen to your body directly related to physical health. Your body, listen to your body directly related to physical health. It's not necessarily age uh, related. A lot of people think old guys or old women get, get burnout. I can tell you that most of the ones that I come in contact with that I deal with are in their 30s. Uh, I have a few that are in their 60s, but they can happen. It's not a respecter of age, of sex, of religion, of you know whatever, all the different things we, we talk about. It can happen at any time, anyone. And it's as much a process as it is a condition. So it's not something you, you go get a shot for and you get fixed. It, it's something you have to kind of manage over your life. And the last thing in the last three or four minutes here I want to talk about is mitigating burnout. And this is my call to action to you. And I've shared this with Joel. And I'm going to kind of go through. There are seven steps. I call them seven areas of, of how to deal with what I, this is my, my list. It's nobody's list but mine. And I break it up into dentists who are in practice now, and then I also break it into dental students and residents who are in practice. And so let's look at number one. Number one is define your practice. What does that mean? Well, I think in dental school, a lot of times we get out and we think that um, everybody has to go into private practice. And I'm here to tell you that we're not all made or set up to all go into private practice to be that the old ideal million dollar practice, whatever that means. We don't all have that ability, even on our best days. Some do, some don't. So define who you are. And you say, well, Bill, you know, I'm 28 years old. Who do I know? 
how do I know who I am? And so my encouragement at that point, you may not know, but begin the journey. And somewhere in the you know, recent, in, in the near future, a couple of years in, find somebody that you admire, that you want to emulate, that you see their practices doing the way kind of dentistry you want to practice and go to them, ask, ask them out to lunch, to dinner, have a talk with them. How can you help me understand what you do? And if I, and if I do, can you help me do that? I mean, help talk to people who are doing that. So you may not say, oh, I want to, you know, only do stainless steel crowns and partials and, and, and how do I do that? Well, you may not know right now, but as you, as you get out into practice and you, you kind of say, well, I kind of like this. Uh, I'd love to see more of this. I wish that never came in again. Then you can kind of define and then look at people who are doing how you define your practice or how they're, they're defining their practice and how you say, I want to be like you, if you will, like be like Mike, you know, Michael Jordan. <laughs> anyway, define your practice. If you're a dental student or resident, define the student type you are or what goals do you have in residency or dental school? Are you that uh, type A personality that wants to be at every CE opportunity? It wants to be at every professor's door every morning asking them a question. If you are, go for it. If that's who you are, do it. But define who you are. Don't let you, just your emotions kind of overtake you. Define how, start now thinking about this is how I want to be and define goals. The second thing is control your schedule, block scheduling, spacing between schedules, quadrant dentistry, more, uh, more and more utilization of staff as long as your state laws allow it, uh, utilization of auxiliaries to do procedures. Um, if you're in dental school, manage your time or, or residency, manage your time off and take care of yourself. Say, you know, I can't control, my, my, I can't control the, the schedule at work because I'm in a residency. They kind of, we do what we're kind of told, but you can manage your time off. Start learning how to manage your, your time, your personal time on and off uh, at work. Uh, minimize your debt. Uh, I know that Joel had someone, I think, or maybe he did it recently about uh, Joel uh, talking about, you know, money and finance. And when I say minimize debt, I know that the, the ADA says the average student comes out now of dental school with about $287,000 worth of, uh, worth of um, um, debt. Let me turn this alarm off here. I think I've telling me to be quiet <laughs> but anyway they come out with a lot of debt and that's just the debt they owe uh and you know um with that type of debt if dentist in, in we're talking about dentists in practice with debt uh have a plan uh, I, i'm just this is just personal opinion that if you have a loan and you've got it over 30 years you need to relook at that you need to relook at the amount of interest that you're paying over 30 years and you need to maybe look at your how you're practicing because debt is bondage. It, it really is in a lot of things, as long as it's, if it goes over a long period of time. If you've got a plan to, you know, take out to pay back two or $300,000 in about a five to 10 year plan, it can be done. That's the way to do it, but not 30 years that you're paying it close to a half million dollars worth of interest in that time. It's just ridiculous. So look at your schedule. Why can't you pay more? And I'm not trying to put pressure on you to manage your money, but you need to minimize your debt as quick as possible. Uh, my daughter is a physician out in San Francisco in residency at UCSF. And, you know, I'm talking to her about, you know, the first five or 10 years, get your school debt out of the way, get it out of the way so you can go on and live life and grow. And so that's my suggestion there. As a dental student, plan debt management. You say, well, I, I, can't, I, I can't pay it back yet because I'm not making any money. Or if you're a resident, you're making some money. My suggestion is start paying $50 a month or $100 a month. Just start in the habit of paying something back and have the discussion with somebody that is out there that can help you uh, talk about how can, if you say, I have a goal of paying this off in seven years, how does, tell me how that happens. We don't have the answers. It's not just simply looking at an amortization chart and figuring out the interest. You can do that, but there's more to it than that because you got, you know, the average dentist comes out of dental school, according to the ADA, uh, making about $118,000 their first year out. Okay, so, you know, you're looking at about 10000 a month. Do the math on that. Figure out a way you can get out of debt in five to 10 years, not 30 years. Um, don't isolate. You've heard me say that. I'll say it again. Stay engaged in your residency. At, uh, if you're a dental student, keep and join groups, speak out, get involved, keep engaged. That's so important. Ask for help. If you don't feel like getting engaged or you can't, you're just exhausted, you can't go. Tell somebody you're not feeling well. 
gosh, dental school is so different today. Residency is so different than it was when I went through it. We were told to pull ourselves up by the bootstraps and get over it. And so now you have resources, but you still have to make that first step, tell somebody. And then the last three, they're, they're basically the same, but keep in touch with your colleagues, take care of yourself and your family, take care of your spiritual life. And, and I, I'm just going to say this because to me, this was a life-changing, a life-changing uh, personal story that I'll tell you just briefly here at the end that uh, when you look at, when you go through, when I went through my dental practice, and at the beginning, when everything negative that went, that happened to me, I looked at myself as a victim that, you know, well, I just, I just don't have it. Or gosh, I, I just knew that happened to me. It always happens to me. But when I kept looking at negative situations as what can I learn from this? What can I grasp from this? What plan does God have for me in the future? This took, this made me take off and this got me involved again. It broke my burnout. And I had, I had burnout in my mid forties. I didn't have it at the end of my career. In fact, right now I'm 67. Uh, I, I love dentistry more than ever, not because I'm not practicing. I'm still teaching at different places, different uh, procedures and techniques. And I love dentistry. It's just that it was time to do something else because I'm more than just a dentist. I'm a person, I have a family, I'm a father, I'm a son, that, you know, that kind of stuff. So uh, I, I just encourage you to be grateful for the good and the bad. And uh, with that, I'm going to stop here and quit preaching. And uh, Joel, if you'll take over and, and let's uh, maybe entertain any questions or comments people may have. Hold on. Can you hear me? Um, if anybody can, um, if they're shy to get on, you know, on uh, a video or audio, you can even just uh, type a question in the chat. Um, I mean, I think there's just so much to unpack here. And I think you just kind of touched the, sur uh, the surface um, with all the things. So uh, anybody want to raise their hand or uh, make any comments or ask any questions? So, you know, I think while we're waiting here, um, I, I think you raised a couple of points here. You know, I think one of the big things is lack of control. Um, and, you know, I think that's one of our biggest stressors and then the stressors just become chronic to the point where um you know it just turns more into burnout and then burnout into crisis um uh, but you know i think when you talked about the physicians versus the dentist um you know i think a lot of the stressors in dentistry is everything everything kind of boils down to you and you kind of take that burden yes with physicians and you know us even working in a uh, in a medical center setting is the lack of control is kind of what's um the, you know and and I kind of wonder, you know, what's, well, I think I kind of froze. What's going to happen, you know, when we have more of the corporate dentistry, um, larger practices, you know, I think it's going to be kind of a different sort of um, burnout feeling lack of control as opposed to everything being falling upon you as the sole proprietor and in charge of everything. Right. Well, and, and that's, a, that's a great question. And, and as a lot of you probably know that the, the direction or the where we're pointing to has to do more with DSOs, corporate group kind of practices. Um, I, I really think back in the 70s when group practices started, because I was uh, not involved with, but I knew a, a, a group of dentists that started a group practice, their focus was more about sharing the financial burden of equipment, staff, things like that. But today, it's, it's like you say, there's so many departments like the, the HIPAA department and the office manager does this and the HR department. And there's so many different things and it's all more and more lack of control. So you, you, you sort of feel like, and you are in a lot, of, a lot of cases, an employee in some situations, some corporate. But I think what's going to happen is that we're going to see more of that and, um, and, and it's going to get worse. I mean, I, I don't, I think it's going to get worse for it. it's addressed. And the way the solutions the physicians are talking about is that the conversation needs to go between the practitioners and management about how can we prevent this, get the experts in to help talk about how we can mitigate it. And I, I think we're going down the exact same path as physicians, just in a different kind of delivery system. Uh, one message I, I didn't talk about that I wanted to get out there, and I hope I'm wrong, and I don't want to paint too broad of a brush here, but I, I sense a lot of times at schools that I talk at that the message is to the dentist, you can't go into private practice and hang a shingle and build your building. You have to go in with somebody because you have such huge debt and you can't 
uh, make it alone out there by yourself. And I could tell, I can tell you nothing is further than the truth. In fact, I've probably helped three dentists just this last year or during COVID that were in, that was in that situation, and they went into corporate and the, and not nothing's wrong with corporate. I mean, there's there's people who love corporate, do well in it, and I encourage if that's who you are, if you define your personality and practice as someone that does corporate and you know it, go for it. But these people were not set up for corporate, but they were told they couldn't make it in private practice. And so we've helped them kind of withdraw from that scene, go into practice by one of them even started, she even started a new practice, one bought into a practice with somebody else and they're doing fantastic. And they got a 10 year plan to pay this debt off along with living expenses. So they're gonna live frugally for the first 10 years. And then, you know, hopefully if things go and continue to grow, then they'll be set to make some, you know, better choices with their money than paying off debt. But you can make it in private practice, solo practice. 73% um, of all practices are still solo in some form, but depending on who you hear, it may be as low as 54%, depending on what kind of model you, you call solo practice. But I'm not, I'm not against group. I'm not against corporate. I'm not against private. I'm just saying, who are you? You know, how do you function? How do you process information? How do you deal with stresses? Uh, if you're somebody that hits the ceiling every time somebody, you know, uh, has uh, cuts, uh, breaks a fingernail, you probably don't want to be in solo practice. <laughs> you know, that kind of stuff. You may want to be in a, 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 a corporate situation. But then again, I've had young dentists come to me and say in tears saying, you know, I, I'm in a corporate model. They told me, that you know, all, all all watches are fillings, fillings are crowns, and crowns are implants, and and no endo we do implants, and 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 I'm going like, and she says, and this cognitive dissonance is going with her saying, I just I can't I can't accept that. There's something wrong about that. We know that root canals work if with everything being equal. You know, they're they're good. It's a good service. They've lasted for years, and they won't let me do them. And and I'm saying, wait, well, you you may want to get out and. And you know, it, as simple as that sounds, a lot of times uh, people need to hear that. You, you have the choice to get out. But if I get out, I'm gonna be scary. What am I gonna do out there? I don't know how to do it. There's help out there. And so I just encourage you to, if you don't know who you are, I, one time I had to ask a friend, who am I? Who do you see myself? Who, who do you see me as? Ask your friend that, they'll tell you. And I think a lot of it is, you know, we, we work so hard you know, just to get into dental school. And then you're spending so much time in dental school just to get out of dental school. Um, and, you know, and to conform to, you know, what needs to be done. And I think by the time you're out, a lot of times, you know, you really don't know who you are, what, what gets you lit up, what, you know, what fires you up. Um, you know, what about dentistry or, you know, in the profession is what, you know, and I, I think when you get away from that, uh, that's when, you know, like you said, there's that cognitive dissonance and, um, I think burnout ensues if you're kind of practicing or you're in, a, in an environment that kind of strays away from what your core values are. I think, you know, as soon as you get out, I think it's just, you got to stop and figure out what your core values are. Right. Um, exactly. Um, you know, and I think I asked you this personally um, and um, I thought it'd be a good one to share and, you know, kind of want to be respectful of everybody's time. But um, when you see people going into crisis, that's one, one you know, one step further. Uh, what are the things that, and you probably touched upon a lot of these here, um, but what, you know, what are the most common things that drive people to, from simply burnout to crisis? Um, well, the, the thing that, the thing that I, I guess that it, uh, and I'll start out giving the kind of the the end result, the unfortunate thing is sometimes it's too late and we see people that maybe have committed suicide or they've attempted suicide or they're in severe depression and, you know, they have to go in inpatient to a hospital for treatment and this kind of stuff. But um, when, when we have somebody that, um, that calls or, I mean, and I'm just saying it it's calls me personally and says, and I, I'm not speaking for the care and dental, but I'm just saying for me personally calls and says, uh, you know, I hate dentistry. Uh, I, I'm ready to get out. And they're 32 years old or they're 65 years old. And I'll, I'll ask them, well, you know, that's a big difference in age. You know, there are different places in their career. And so I'll ask them, what made you stay in, say, the 65-year-old? I'll say, what made you stay in dentistry 
to age 65, if you hated it so much, did you hate it always? And they'll say no. So I try to pinpoint what the source of burnout was. What was it? Was it, was it when that wonderful assistant moved to Raleigh or, you know, moved out of town and you couldn't find anybody to replace her. And then you ended up doing all the stuff and then you started getting reactive to your employees and, or, or, or was it somebody that died? I mean, what, what we try to pinpoint it, but a, a lot of times, I mean, it's, it's rare. It's rare that people will just come up and say, I'm burned out. I have emotional exhaustion and depersonalization and I'm ready to go for treatment or get some help from my doctor. Uh, that's rare. But what we do here are things like, I, uh, somebody told me to call you, you know, it says, you know, something about burnout says, I hate dentistry. Usually that's the first term they say is I hate dentistry. And then I try to divide the two out. What do you hate about it? Is it the, you know, the, like I talked earlier, the this peripheral stuff, the HIPAA, the forms, that employ, the dealing with employees, or is it the, the clinical part? And if they say it's the, the HIPAA and the employees and all that stuff, then, you know, I may kind of direct them in a, in a way of maybe a group practice or a uh, I, I'm, I'm a little hesitant at that point to even mention corporate because sometimes the corporate model can put pressures on you that you may not be aware of, like your production's down and they're wanting you to produce this much in the next two weeks or you're going to be fired. And you're saying, well, I can't do it because y'all aren't sending me the patients. And, you know, it's that I'm not in control thing again. Uh, but I'm not saying that happens in every corporate situation. Corporate dentistry has its place and it does well. It's very efficient in what it does. It's just it was not who I was. So you have to kind of know, but to, it's, it's kind of a vague answer. I know I'm not really giving you succinct ABC, but it's more like when they start out with, I hate dentistry, then if they say, oh, I hate the clinical part, I just hate the clinical part. Then I say, do you, do you, do you feel like there's a place for you? Uh, you know, as, as we talked earlier, what would it take for you to like dentistry or what would be the, what would, what, what, what would take, what would it take for you to say, yes, I want to stay in dentistry? something like that. And then if they say things like, well, I've always liked being uh, a research, research and things and, and administrative kind of stuff, you know, like research projects. Maybe there's a place in public health. Maybe there's a place at university. Maybe there's, you know, all this kind of stuff. There's places for you. I mean, I have one friend that got tired of dentistry in, in his early uh, 50s, and he became a lab consultant for a big dental lab in, in the country. And he, he does all their implant cases now that come in. He he talks with the doctor one-on-one -on -one and is sort of the liaison there and he's paid quite well to do that. So there's, there's different ways, but um, I'm kind of going on here, rambling on a little bit, but it, it's uh, the, the key is to, if your friends tell you something's not right with you today, Joel or Bill, you know, listen to them. They're not just saying that to, to be mean if they're your true friends. Um, I, I just, I just think you need to, but the problem is, you know, we shut down. We don't want to tell anybody. How, how are you doing? You know, we get the teenage answer. How are you doing? Fine. Well, how's work? Good. Do you have any exciting cases? No. Are you happy? Yes. You know, it's that kind of one word answers instead of saying. So one thing I started doing, I have a friend uh, in town here that I go to uh, lunch with him about once every two months. I try to do it more often. I have another friend in Charlotte. We go to see him once every quarter and we go out and spend the evening together at, at a restaurant talking about you know, directions he wanted to go, what he wanted to, he, and he thinks I'm helping him. He's helping me because I see the struggles that are going on in today's world. And I'm not an expert in that. I mean, I don't have, you know, how to design a dental office and how to hire these, but I know that you need people that know more than I do to help you. And I can certainly direct you in that direction. Yeah, and I think you really emphasize a good point. You know, I think um, part of it inherent in dentistry is the competition aspect and kind of individualism, whereas in medicine, you know, we see so much more. Um, I mean, this is why I, we, I kind of put this together and wanted to, you know, wanted to do this. You know, there's just, um, you know, there's a lot of it prevalent in, in medicine, you know, to provide support and collegiality. Whereas yes. I think in dentistry, it's really more uh, individualism and competition and just trying to show that you're doing really well. I mean, I think inherent, you know, you look at all the dental magazines, it's all it's all individuals trying to show how, how, how good they are. Right. Um, and no. I, I think just what you created is such a great space, you know, for dentists to provide support and collegiality and talk about things that aren't necessarily about, you know, um, how great everybody is, you know? Right. Can I, can I tell a little short story that might sure. kind of close this out along that topic topic? When I was in residency, um, at, at MUSC, I was in, the, uh, ER, I used to go to the ER on Tuesday nights just to, 
suture people up, feet, hands, heads, whatever, you know, just to get experience. And of course, the ENT docs were there. I wasn't just, you know, lone ranger in it, so to speak. There were people there telling me what to do. I just wanted to get experience in suturing techniques. And this was back in 1980, so it's a long time ago. Uh, while I was there one night, uh, I was there in a, a ER doc that I befriended. He came over and he said, you know, uh, we've got this guy that's, um, he's committed suicide. He's still alive, but he said, do you mind sitting with him and watching him um, until he dies? And back then there were no, I mean, there were machines, but it wasn't all this stuff that you, t the way they do now. And I'm going like, you know, my eyes got real big, like, do what? And he said, yeah, I want you to sit and just monitor his vitals until he dies. He had, had a gunshot wound to the head. So they bring him in and he in, ended up living two or three hours and he finally died. And when it was over, it was about midnight. And, and I said to the, the physician that was handling the case, he, well, he actually looked at me and he says, you want to grab a bite to eat? And I said, sure. He said, I got to do something first though. So he left and I stood out in the hallway waiting for him. He never came. I, I, so a few minutes later, I started looking for him, asking, no one knew where he was. And so I thought, well, I don't guess he wants to go. Maybe he went to the cafeteria. So I walked on to the cafeteria. And as I was walking down the hall, there was a door that was cracked open. And there was a little room in there and the guy was sitting in there just, he had his hands and his forehead just bawling his eyes out. And I walked in and I said, Steve, what's, what's going on here? And he goes, I, I can't do this stuff every day. He said, this, this just tears me up. And, and I said, do you have anybody to talk about it? And he said, yeah, we've got a, a group here at, at the hospital. It was a group of physicians. And some of you may know that model called the Balint Group uh, out of England. Mr. and Mrs. or doctor and doctor, I believe it was Balint. There were psychotherapists or psychologists. I believe one may have been an orthopedic physician, but they started a group back in the 50s, I believe, called the Balint Group, B-A-L-I-N-T, the Balint Society. And we have a society here in America. And it's, it's usually at res in residencies where a, a collection of doctors get together and they don't talk over clinical stuff. They talk over, you know, emotional, what you're dealing with, the loss of patient life or, you know, difficult patients. And I thought, why don't we have that in dentistry? Why don't we have that in dentistry? And so I encourage you at wherever you are, whether it's in residency or when you get out and practice, befriend people, get, get the conversation going, keep it going, show up at, at dental society meetings across the state, wherever you may live. I can tell you that if you go to the, the dental society meetings in most of the towns I go to, and I speak at different ones, they're all 50 and older. We don't see any of the young people. I know they're out there. I know they're busy. I know they've got a lot of competition with a lot of, you know, personal and, and things like things they do with the kids and they're tired, all this stuff, but keep in touch with the people that, that, that we, that we work with and for and through. I mean, it's, it's important. And so um, communication, don't isolate. That's, that's huge. That's wonderful advice. Um, where can, uh, the participants here kind of uh, reach you or, uh, you know, yes. just kind of ask you for questions. Yeah. If you want to, um, there's my cell phone number. Um, I will tell you up front, if you call me and your name is not in my book, I don't answer, but leave a message. I will call you back. Cause you know, we all get that call about uh, your student loans have been, uh, you're in, you're in bankruptcy, uh, social security has got your number or, you know, all these things you owe, you owe money down in Florida it's all this mar this scam stuff. So I don't answer. But if you leave a message, you tell me who you are, I will call you back. Probably the easiest way that I'll respond, though, will be through that Dr. Violin at carolina.rr.com. And I'll be glad to, um, you know, I, and I just want to say up front, I'm not a counselor. I'm not certified to teach anybody anything. I'm just one of you. I'm one of practicing dentists that went through a residency program. I know what the real world's like. And I, uh, at least from my, my viewpoint, and I can, I can get you in touch with people who should know about where to get you answers. And that's, that's what it's about. It's, you know, getting out of our shell and, and engaging again and being efficient and productive. Well, this was wonderful. We really appreciate you uh, joining us and, uh, you know, you. looking forward to doing this again. But uh, um, anyways, uh, you, you know, feel free to reach out to him. Feel free to reach out to me. Um, and certainly, uh, you know, we appreciate you. Thank you, Dr. Clater, for joining us tonight. And uh, um, this was thank everybody that's uh, spent their St. Patty's Day with us. Yeah. And, uh, oh, okay. uh, thank you. Yeah. Good luck. And yeah. uh, we'll see you next session. And uh, uh, good night.
Good night. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Crater. Thank you, Dr. Nepenas. Thank you.